Walter, you want to come up here with your special guest? He's going to drag him around the other way. <laughs> Francois is a slippery little rascal, and he tends to slide away when you least expect it. <laughs> he, he doesn't I'm scared want to of knock that thing, that thing down. <laughs> Might have run out of miracles. Now, little buddy, if he tries to do anything or harm you, I'm going to sit right over there and you let me know and I'll come take care of him. Take care of him right now. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you want to hear the story how this man came here. Can you hear the thunder? <laughs> it's so interesting. I had a phone call from people in Botswana. They said, we cannot get hold of Walter. We want him to come and speak at the university. We're looking for a second best. <laughs> Don't laugh at second bests. <laughs> so I said, well, I'll try and get hold of him. So they asked me if I cannot get hold of him, would I come? So I contacted his committee. Sonica is the committee, because he accepts 10 appointments for the same week. And it's a big mix-up when everybody wants him there, and so he, she's doing it. So he came up to my place for a little rest. That's really true. I find it very hard to say no, and they always phone me at the most inopportune moment. And then I say, yes, sure, yeah. And then the next thing I know, it's all arranged, and I'm going to the Ukraine and to Australia on the same day. <laughs> so, he reminds me of Jonah. So he came to me for a little rest, a little holiday. How did you enjoy the holiday? I love my holidays with him. He says, we're going on a little holiday. I said, please don't invite me for a holiday. I'm coming to work. Because his holidays are a nightmare. <laughs> you get off the plane, you end up in a hall, and you don't come out until you go onto the plane again. So I don't want these holidays. I want to work next time. <laughs> anyway, we went to Botswana. But while he was with me on this holiday, he decided not to go to Nineveh. Get the story. So he was going down to his house, 2,000 kilometers away from my place. But you know, the Lord, is, the Lord is brilliant. On his way, we were going to drive about 600 k's, and then he would go left, and I would go right. He's a wicked man, but he's got good points. So what happened at a certain town? He smashed into a, the vehicle was standing, and he smashed into it, and his car was a wreck. It wasn't standing. I was driving along quite merrily, and, and I, I really was in big stress, because I had to go to Canada to do recordings, and this man was occupying all my vacation time. And so I decided I have to prepare. I cannot go to Botswana. It's impossible. And I was driving behind this vehicle, and he was behind me. And there was a, an African car in front of me. Have you ever seen an African car? Well, it's tied together with... Uh, with what is it tied together? No, it's not even wire. Wire lasts. I think it's spit. And I thought, this guy is dangerous. The vehicle is dangerous. I have to get past this vehicle. And there was a long straight, not even a curve, nothing. And I said, well, there's a semi-truck coming from the front. I'll pass him as soon as this truck is past me. 
And so when that truck got to him, I started accelerating to go past him, not realizing that he was stuck together with spit. And as that truck came past him, the wind went, <laughs> you know how it goes? And his car fell apart. <laughs> Literally in front of me. The bonnet flew up, the fenders flew off, the, the, I don't know, everything came flying. And of course he couldn't see where he was going because his hood was up. And so he decided to go and stand like this in the road. And I was already accelerating to go past him. And the truck was next to me, I couldn't go to the right, there was a big ravine on the left. So I decided to pay him a visit. So that's where Jonah was spit out by the fish. <laughs> and he had to go to Botswana. And the doctor there was so impressed with Walter that he told Ray Clutty, get this man Walter to come here. No, he said, you too. <laughs> Something like that. And I got a phone call from Ray. Where's Ray and Mark? Or oh, uh, Luke? Would you like to fill in here, Ray? Okay. By the way, he's the exact same image of Pharaoh the Tut Tutmosis the third, the slave driver. <laughs> I'm not going to go on holiday with him either. <laughs> and you know, Ray phoned me one morning. He said, I want you to come to Loma Linda. I want Walter to, to come. They usually work through me to get to him. Anyway, this is how we are here. And he, pardon? Connections work. And this is wonderful. We've been working together about 25 years. This, the two funniest people you've ever met. <laughs> As you've seen, what a contrast. But you know, we love the Lord and we want the third angel's message to be proclaimed. He's doing it from an intellectual hook, corner, approach. And I use the simple excavations. We put it together and there's a buyer for every product. I love you people. Thank you for your kindness, accepting foreigners, Wil jy vertel van die begin of nie? Wat is begin? How we met? Yes, why not? And how, how everybody just loved it that we worked together. Yeah, I, I met him at Stellenbosch. But you know when tires are pumped, what do you call it? We call it bars. 2.2 .2 bars or do you call it port? You know bars? PSI. PSI. Pounds per square inch. Okay. And I realized that this man's tires were pumped too, too hard. It was bumpy. And I asked the Lord to just get that tires a little down. And well, I pushed him, not that I like to do it, to come and work with me. And the Lord opened the way and we worked together. But you know, not everybody likes Walter. <laughs> and they said to me, uh, this, this man that's now working with you, uh, don't do this and don't do that and, you know, keep a low profile with this man. And, you know, I had to make a decision to just discard my friend or to take orders from the higher organizations, but I was convinced that this is the man that I prayed for to be an evangelist, because I'm getting old and we've got to get young chaps to, to carry on the work. And he was an answer to prayer. But I want to tell you, if you work with Walter, it's, it's something. <laughs> There's always a crisis in his life. <laughs> because of the message he preached. But I persevered and I said, Lord, I cannot let this man lose we cannot lose him for the cause. And the Lord blessed his ministry. And we've shed tears together and we laugh together. We work together. And it was such a privilege to work with him again after many years. 
to run a, a campaign. I think I've said enough, hey? You can go. <laughs> there was a young man who spent a long time visiting us and living in our home. And uh, there were a lot of young people that always came to our, our house. was chaotic. Chaotic. Once you become part of this church, life just becomes chaotic. And this young man then emigrated to the United States of America. And then he became a psychiatrist. And I think our, our church needs psychiatrists. Because the message creates so many problems that we develop unstable minds. <laughs> and so I want to call this young psychiatrist to come to the front. I don't know what his name is. It used to be something and then it changed to something else and now it's both. As long as you call me up, Walter, that's fine. Or whatever you call me. I used to call him, we used to call him Deju. But then it became Joshua, but now it's Joshua Deju. That's or right. Joshua Deju. Nobody can pronounce uh, Deju, so we just go with my middle name, which is now, Joshua. I asked him to read some things. A psychi psychiatric message for this church. Tell them what you were trained for in this in this country. There's a lot of people out here, Walter. You said they were just being going to be Read. a few. Read. Keep quiet. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you live in his house. <laughs> so, brothers and sisters, good morning. The sure word of prophecy is the foundation of Adventism, Ellen White says. And... Um, in counsels to writers and editors, she says, we are to repeat the words of the pioneers in our work. Let the truths that are the foundation of our father, faith be kept before the people. We are now to understand what the pillars of our faith are, the truths that have made us the people that we are, leading us step by step. The great waymarks of truth showing us our bearing in prophetic history are to be carefully guarded lest they be torn down and replaced by theories that will bring confusion rather than light. Regarding the third angel's message, the power which so mightily stirred the people in the 1844 movement will again be revealed. The third angel's message will again go forward, not in whispered tones, but with a loud voice, that the light of the present truth will be seen flashing everywhere. Amen. Thank you for that psychiatric advice. <laughs> Isn't that what we need? If we want to be healthy in our minds, then we must do what God asks of us. And there will be opposition, like Francois said. Opposition tells us sometimes that we're on the right track. We read in Malachi chapter 3 verse 2, Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? You said, it is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? I I'm, I'm think Jacob also felt like that, didn't he? So now we call the proud blessed for those who do wickedness or raised up. They even tempt God and they go free. But what's the solution to the crisis? Then those who feared the Lord. I've got the New King James and it's irritating me in this verse. I like it otherwise, but there are some verses where it irritates me and this is one. Then those who feared the Lord, what does the King James say? Spake 
often one to another. This one doesn't have the word often. I miss it. Then those who feared the Lord spoke often one to another. And the Lord listened and heard them. And so a book of remembrance was written before him for those who feared the Lord and who meditate on his name. So if you are in this depression, and if you feel bad about the circumstances in the church, take Joshua or Deju's psychiatric advice. Get back to the pillars of Adventism and preach the three angels' messages. And you will find health. And he says, They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make up my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then shall you again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. There is a time coming. There is a time coming when there will be a difference. So hang in there. And if the opposition has been nagging at you and is getting you down, rise up. There's coming a day and it will happen. Now I've been requested over and over again to say why I'm here or what is my testimony. And I said, ah, everybody knows it. I'm not going to talk about my testimony. I don't like talking about all of those things. They will know it. And they said, yes, so what? What if they all know it? Say it again. And I said, no, I don't want to. But here it says, then those who feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord heard. So maybe for those who haven't heard it, and for those who have heard it, maybe I can share some other insights or whatever. Why am I here? Why am I doing this? What fires me? You know, many people, many people who, who are against this message will say, Why are you so arrogant? Why don't you just can it? Why don't you give up? Can't you see we don't want it? And then I say, Well, I'm not going to speak in this name again. And then I said, Lord, I'm not going to do this again. I I'm a, I'm really am a Jonah. Everywhere I go, I have to be spat out by a whale. It's a nightmare. It's very slimy business. I don't want to go, Lord. I don't want to. Leave me alone. And then I go onto my mountain and I walk and I talk to God. And if he doesn't use me for two days, I freak. <laughs> and I say, what's the matter? Are, are you not going to use me anymore? You said you didn't want to. Yes, but I, wasn't, I didn't mean it. <laughs> and then off I go again. And I said, no, I really mean it. I'm not going to do this again. You know, everywhere I went in the beginning of my ministry, there was always a letter preceding me. Don't let this man talk. Oh, I've had experiences. I've had whole conferences forbid the members to come and listen. In one conference they said, if anyone attends, everyone who attends will be disfellowshipped. Everyone who attends will be this fellowship. They even went further than that. Line them up against the wall and disfellowship them. Well, they never did disfellowship them because it was about as many as sitting here today. And they couldn't afford the loss of tithes. So. <laughs> the Lord is good. But it's not bad everywhere. But everywhere it will have its bad moments, isn't it so? Yeah. And so we can choose, as my friend Francois says, between the two B's. We can become better or we can become bitter. What actuates one just to carry on and to carry on and to carry on in spite of opposition and in spite of what happens? It's experience. If you've had an experience with God and 
you see people making decisions for God, it does something. And it spurns you on and you don't want to give up. You say, I cannot stop this. I cannot stop this. What did Jeremiah said? Say, Jeremiah said, I'm never going to speak in this name. Oh, I identify with Jeremiah. I'm not going to speak in this name again. Ah, oh, but then your word was a fire in my heart and I could not forbear. And that's what it's going to be like. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be tough. Now, I don't base my faith on experience. I base my, base my faith on the Word of God. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't give one experience, isn't that so? Because He's kind and He's generous and He's long-suffering. Now, when I was out there in the world and I was an atheist and I hated God with a passion, I loathed God. I really hated Him. Why would I hate God with such a passion? If a student in my class just dared to say, excuse me, I believe in creation, as one little girl said to me, Oof, I would blast her. I would blast them. And it, you know, it's always the girls that got up and said it. Don't underestimate the women. It's always the ladies, not the men. They just sat there. They answered him not a word. <laughs> the ladies, they were so irritating. <laughs> yes, and why did I hate God? Because you know the story. My mother was Lutheran. I was raised Catholic. And my mother got sick when I was eight. And she died when I was 12. And for four years I was told every day in religious instruction that my mother was going to roast in hell forever and ever and ever because she was a Lutheran and not a Catholic. And so I hated not the instructor. Well, I hated the instructor too. In fact, I actually took the catechism and threw it at her. I paid dearly for that. I had to sit outside. I was in a Lutheran school with a Catholic instruction and the headmaster would always say what are you doing out here and I say that how do you say it nicely that female dog <laughs> threw me out now you're not allowed to say that when you're eight or nine years old then you were modified on the posterior so I got very used to being modified but I was bitter and I hated this God this God who would be such an obnoxious being that he would roast someone forever and ever and ever who was dear to me. And so I rejected him. And I threw religion out. And when I became a scientist and an evolutionist, this was the feeling in my heart. So I was not an atheist because of what the Word says, I was an atheist because of what theology says. Beware of the theologians. Beware of the scribes. They will travel from east to west to gain one convert and make him twice the child of hell that he was before. Not my words, God's words. So yes, I was an atheist. And I met my dear wife through her brother. And that family was weird. <laughs> the father was into spiritism. The mother was more into atheism. Highly educated people, professors and highly educated. And so I kicked him out as a roommate and eventually took her in as a roommate. She's much nicer than he was. And so we became a couple, and we were atheists. But my father-in-law was a brilliant man. He was such fun to be with. He was such a nice person. Don't think spiritists and occultists are unpleasant, evil people. He was a pleasure to be with. And he was so educated, and he could 
talk on so many issues and he knew all the religions. He probably read this Bible 40 times but misappropriated it and trained me in all kinds of occult techniques. I could do out-of-body experiences, all kinds of amazing things that we as Adventists don't even dream of as being possible. But of course, these are hypnotic implants because you've placed yourself under another power. And so these are not just conjectures, they're real, they actually happen. And I could, my wife would say, what's the child doing next door? And I would say, I'm too tired to get up, I'm going to oob, have an out-of-body experience. And then go and tell her exactly what the child was doing, how it was lying and where the bottle was and where this was and everything, without leaving the bed. Of course, that's a hypnotic implant. It's not a real occurrence. And so the esoteric world became real to us. My wife grew up in a home where walking sticks rattled and where chairs had an indentation and apparitions were breathing in chairs that you couldn't see. And she grew up with this as normal. This wasn't normal to me, though. I was just plain atheist which means you believe anything, not nothing. And this is how it all began. And then when our youngest child was uh, about to be born, my wife got very ill, and she nearly died in this pregnancy, and they were urging us to do an abortion to save her life. But somehow we refused to do an abortion. And they didn't have scanners in those days like they have today. There was one somewhere, I still remember taking her in uh, this vehicle and carrying her in and having the scans done and he was alive and well and sucking his thumb and we just couldn't abort him. And when he was born, eventually, he was a miserable child. Miserable beyond comprehension. He would scream and, and huddle up and you had, to, you had to wrap him up and try and feed him. My wife was very busy with this child. Her whole life became wrapped up in this child. And then I had a number of strange occurrences. And that was I woke up at two o'clock in the morning and I had this dream that I was being strangled and murdered and I'd wake up in the sweat, and then the child would scream as though he were being slaughtered. And we'd run and pick him up, and he'd get this terrible fever and fever cramps. We'd rush him to hospital, and they would battle to save this child's life. On some occasions, when this happened again and again, every time at exactly the same time of night, I was so scared of two o'clock in the morning. Every time the same thing. Sometimes he would stop breathing before we got him to the hospital and they would battle to resuscitate him and get him back to life. Now, you know, this, if this happens once or twice, it's, it's pure chance. But if it happens over and over and over and over again, I don't even know how many times it happened. Then you start saying this is not chance, this is something supernatural. My father-in-law did everything in his power to ban these evil spirits. He did his pentagram signs in the corners and he brought his, his paraphernalia. But nothing happened. Nothing helped. And then, when I was sitting in that hospital, we used to take turns, my wife and I, and we used to watch this little child... And that night at 2 o'clock he was lying there in his little cool tent in the hospital full of drips and infusions. At 2 o'clock he went into this, this cramp situation. And he nearly died that night and all these tubes tore out and there was blood all over the place. And, and, and I said, that's it, I've had enough. I need help. The occult world is doing nothing. There's no such thing as prayer. I don't know God. But I did know one thing. 
And that was that the Roman Catholic Church was known for its exorcism. You know, the exorcist and all those things? So I said to myself, well, oh, this thing's making a funny noise, eh? Let me just try and see whether I can change something here. Is it better? And so I said to myself, atheist or no atheist, I'm going to the Catholic Church. And I went to the Catholic Church and I came there and the priest said, no, 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 no. I said, I have a problem in my home. Can you help me? He says, what nature? I said, there are strange things happening. He said, no, I don't want to know anything about you, uh, about this. Give me your phone number. We'll call you. And I went. That's all. And then I got the phone call and there was a meeting arranged and I went to a monastery and met this Roman Catholic priest, an old man. And he said that uh, he knew about my situation. I said, uh, how do you know about my situation? He just did that. And he said, the devil is trying to kill your youngest son. That impressed me because I hadn't said that to anyone. And then he said, I've known about it for two weeks. I said, that's impossible. I'm, <laughs> this is since yesterday that we're talking about these things. He says, no, for two weeks I've known about this. And he even showed me a letter that he had permission from the bishop to do a mass in my house before I even went to them. It had been signed. That was very impressive. Very impressive. So he came to our house and he did his exorcism and he did all the things that he did. And when he came into that little child's house, some spirit grabbed him and threw him around the room. And I thought he was going to die. And then eventually he came right and he, uh, and he same thing happened in our room. And then he said, we must say the Mass in this room. In this room we must say the Mass. And so he said the Mass in that room, and he took off, I still remember, he said, I brought a relic of a saint. In his ring he had a relic. And he put it on the table, and as he was about to start, all our pets, Rottweilers, cats, everything, <laughs> came running and sat in a circle. Very impressive. And he said the Mass. And when he'd finished the Mass, he took off his ordination cross and he said, hang this above the child's bed, which we did. And that night, for the first time, this little child lay on his back, googly googling like normal kids should. And fell asleep right through the night, and the next, and the next, and the next, and the problem was gone. It was gone. That didn't change me. I was still an atheist. I just said, well, that's great, thank you. My wife gave this man a pottery pot that she had made. She was giving classes in pottery. And he said, I'll give this to the nuns that never see the world. And off he went. Well, then we just, he's going to fix this problem. Is this Francois? Yes. Thank you. Is that better? Yes, now it won't pop so much. Anyway, while he was gone, and, he, and there was this peace in our home, my father had died some time before, and I had a little bit of money, and I said to my wife, let's change the house, and uh, let's give you a nice new kitchen. And being German, I took a sledgehammer and demolished the old one. Much to her dismay, she had to cook outside in the garage on a little gas burner until this new kitchen should arrive and the man who was supposed to put in the new kitchen was a German carpenter and he came to our house and he said uh, by the way before I start putting in this new kitchen I just want to tell you that I walk with the Lord can I tell you something about the Lord who my old animosity rose like a mushroom and I said to him, you know what, you can keep your God, and you can walk with your God, I want a kitchen. 
So he was a little bit taken aback. But he had the guts to give me a pamphlet. And I thought, oh, another one of these Jesus freaks. Uh, and I took the pamphlet and I wanted to throw away, but he was standing there. So I went to the lounge and I shoved it in a drawer and I closed it. And he never spoke about it again. I don't think he dared. And then life went on as usual. A month went by, two months went by, three months went by, perfect peace in my house. And then my conscience started talking to me. And I said to myself, you're a hypocrite. You say you're an atheist. The Roman Catholic Church comes to your house and sorts out your problem. And you don't reciprocate in any way whatsoever. You're a hypocrite. So one way I tried to appease my conscience, I went to the Roman Catholic Church and I said, I see your roof is in a bit of disarray. Can I pay to have it fixed for you? So I fixed the Roman Catholic Church's roof. Can you believe that? <laughs> I fixed their roof. <laughs> they won't get the latter rain after that. But then my conscience carried on working in me, and so I went back to church. And believe it or not, became a practicing Catholic with everything that it entails, everything. And uh, I spoke with the priest about evolution. There was no problem. Evolution, of course, that's a fact. We all know evolution happened, so I had no problem with that. So this was an arrangement. And then that fateful day, this was about a year after the exorcism, when I sat in that medic, stood in that medical class and I was describing the functions of the kidneys to the medical students. But in the process, I did the whole evolution of the kidney from its first simple stages all the way through to the fantastic kidney we have. And this young girl again got up in my class and said, excuse me, I don't believe what you are saying. I believe God created that kidney. I lambasted her. I ridiculed her. That class was laughing. And she sat down and cried. It was only when, Sonica? When did I discover who she was? How long ago? When did we discover who she was? Was it a year ago or a year and a half ago? About a year ago. Only a year ago did I discover who she was. She was a Seventh-day Adventist. And she's married. She's married to a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. And she now resides in the United States of America. But she sat in my class. And when she heard that I had become an Adventist, she first fell off her chair because she wouldn't believe it. She wouldn't believe it. You know what? Little thing. You say a little thing and you get a slap as a consequence. You never know. Francois has made many enemies. He baptized this one woman and her husband said, I'll kill you. If you baptize her, I'll kill you. But Francois has this philosophy, do what is right and leave the consequences to God. And so he baptized her and the man threatened to come with his shotgun and kill him while doing this. Well, he did come, but he didn't bring his shotgun. But he was furious, furious. And uh, that was about 24 years ago, I would say. He was so angry. I'm digressing, but I'm just telling you, filling in a little bit. And after the service, he confronted Francois. Now, Francois is a very tall man. You've noticed that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and my wife prodded me and said, they were talking out there, and this man was very agitated. 
And so I saw, ooh, here's trouble, here's trouble. So I ran up there, and just as I got there, I stepped between him and Francois, but his hand was already back to take the punch. And fortunately, he was aiming at Francois's face. And I got my shoulder in between his face, and so he hit me here. <laughs> and I went flying. I didn't know I could fly, but I went flying. <laughs> and I ended up way over there. And he got a fright, and he ran away, this man. So we took a blow from this man, right? Right? And for the next 24 years, this man made his wife's life hell on earth. And she stuck it out and went to church. And he would be impossible. Nobody was allowed near him. If he would dare to even mention can he talk, he would kill him in his house. He was baptized last year. So take a blow every now and then. Do you get the message? Take a blow every now and then, but stand up for the Lord. But when I got back to my office after doing this to this young girl, I, said, I sat down there pretty chuffed with myself for a while until that little voice kicked in. And the little voice said, you know what, you're a hypocrite. You go to church, and here is someone, they say they believe in God, and you treat them like like they're dogs. What does a good Catholic do when he thinks he's overstepped the line? Goes to confession. So off I decided, all right, I'll go to confession. But it was a bad time. It was lunchtime. And uh, the priest wasn't there. So I knocked. I'm a very persistent man. I'm a German. I went and knocked at the nun's quarters and I said, where's this priest? This is very inconvenient that he's not here. I want him right now. And they said, no, he's gone. He's gone shopping, but he should be back within a 15 minutes, half an hour. Why don't you sit and wait? So I went and waited in the church. And the little red light was burning, which means the consecrated host is there. And so I started speaking to God. But as I spoke to him, I realized I'm speaking to the consecrated host, the Corpus Christi, the body of Christ. That means he's dead. He's not alive. It's just a, a host. And I received no feedback. And I was irritated because the priest wasn't coming. And my whole religious experience went through and I had this burden and I wanted to get rid of it. And the priest wasn't coming. I couldn't get rid of the burden. And I couldn't offload it on God because he was dead. This is what I'm thinking. And so I'm thinking by myself, now, what do I do in this church? I come to this church. I, when the bell rings, I go down. The priest says, and the Lord, we with you. And then we sing, and with you. And then the whole congregation goes, Amen. Oh, Every single time. I'm not mocking. This is, this is reality. This is what happens in the Roman Catholic Church. And the bell rings and you go on your knees. And the bell rings and you get up. And you say, oh, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. You know, I've said it already. I can say it very fast. And you say those and you go this and you do that. And I said, this, is, this, this is, must be terribly boring to God. He hears the same thing over and over and over. Is there no communication? Is there no relationship? What is this? And I thought to myself, you know what? You're an idiot. You've been duped again into some religiosity, and this is all a lot of hocus-pocus rubbish. And I was angry, and the priest didn't come, so I said, a terrible thing. I made a terrible mistake. No, it wasn't a mistake. It was the best thing I ever did. But at the time, it seemed like a mistake. I said, if you exist, 
Reveal yourself to me. But I'm out of here. I'm going back to my atheism. This is the last time I put my foot in a church. And I walked out in a half. Something wrong with my speaker? Thank you. We're going to try low range. Four by four. Anyway, wow, I better speed up quickly. What happened then was I came home and I was looking for something and I said to my wife, where is it? And she said, up the left hand, click, 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 click. I opened it up, took it out, whatever I was looking for, and my eye fell on this pamphlet and the pamphlet said the commandments of God had been changed. And that's where it all started. And I looked at it. And I asked her if we have a Bible, and we don't have a Bible. And then I remembered a box her old lady had given me, and I looked in there, and there was a Bible, and I compared it, and yes, it was right. And I fetched that carpenter to my house, and we went through Revelation, and we went through Daniel, and he showed me the little horn, and he showed me all of these things, and my eyes went brrrr. And then he told me about the Ten Commandments and how they changed the Sabbath and that the Sabbath is the real day and that we must keep the Sabbath day. And I said, but that's ridiculous. Why keep the Sabbath day? Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Why must you keep it? For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. That's ludicrous. We came into existence through evolution. He said, no, we did not. And I said, yes, we did. And he tried to argue with me. He was a carpenter. <laughs> I treated him like I treated that young girl. And eventually, after a long try, he said, you know what? I don't have a problem with evolution. You do. <laughs> and he walked off. And that's where it all started. And I started questioning and I said, well, if you exist, then is there something wrong with this evolution? And all this battle starts and I get to work and somebody hands me a big document. Remember, never at work did I discuss religion. I was the atheist lecturer at the university. The secretary gives me this document and I'm looking at it and it says, why Sunday is the true day of rest. I thought, what's he giving me this for? I mean, I never discussed religion with her in my life. And I'm, I'm rattling with evolution. I haven't got time for this. I give it to my wife. And my wife goes through this document as to why Sunday is the true day of rest, and she decides the Sabbath is the true day of rest. You see, there was not one verse from the Bible all of it was what people had said. And so this document against the Bible convinced her that the Bible is true. So the moral of the story is you can do nothing against the truth. You can only do something for the truth. Now as all of this was happening, and I wasn't prepared to accept this new truth just like that, my, I had a dream at 2 o'clock at night and my son went through the same ritual but not so bad. And then the Adventists were praying for us and I didn't even know it and it subsided. Anyway, they convinced us to go to church. I've already told you that, how I went to church and how I went with my jeans and all of that. But I'll tell you another little story. And there I was in this church and I looked at all these satchel and signing morning face people and then I went to lunch with them. Oh, good grief. <laughs> what a nightmare. The first time we went to lunch with these people, they were all, by pure chance, health reformers. <laughs> In my country, only a small percentage is really health reformers. Meat is the main diet. It's a big battle. But by chance, I don't believe in chance, they were all health reformers. What a nightmare. Halfway through, my wife burst into tears. I had to take her home. 
And there she was crying and crying for about an hour, but our kids had stayed with these people. We had to go back to pick up our kids. <laughs> and so we decided, okay, we'll go back. The next Sabbath we went again to church, but I was looking for an excuse. I, I didn't feel I wanted to go. And they all wanted to go to church, and then they said, well, you know, the children and all. I said, leave the kids here. And I sat in these people's home, and I said, I'll take care of the kids. I don't feel like going to church. So my wife went with them, and I was alone there forever. Do you know how long these people go to church? Twenty minutes. I mean, when I was a Roman Catholic, twenty minutes tops. Ten minutes sometimes. You got a mass. Out of there. What is this nonsense? They start at nine o'clock and they come out at one o'clock and then they go back. This is ludicrous. So I had lots of time, and I was reading the Book of Job, going through the Book of Job. And as I was reading the book of Job, I read there, now this really happened. It really happened. I was reading the book of Job and it says, and God permitted Satan to touch Job and Job broke out in sores. And I read this and I closed it and I threw the Bible down and I said, you know, what a load of rubbish. What a load of rubbish. Here I am again sitting in some religious sect that munches carrot leaves from morning till night. <laughs> My wife is stuck there in church forever. And here they say Satan caused sores. This is rubbish. Sores are caused by infections. It's a bacterial infection. You have cut yourself, hurt yourself, and you got infected. And maybe a streptococcus, staphylococcus, or whatever that's stuck in there. You need an antibiotic, but this is rubbish. Satan doesn't touch you and you break out in boils. So I started reading again, and the more I read it, the more irritated I got with a supernatural story. I mean, for a scientist, would you agree it's pathetic? And so I got angry, and I got agitated, and I, and I was looking at my watch. When is this wife of mine coming out of that church? I want to go home. I want to give up this nonsense. I'm going back to my normal lifestyle. This is, this is a waste of time. And then I read again. And I was still irritated with this, and I, got a, I was aware of a pain. And I couldn't figure out the pain, and it got worse and worse. And in the end, it was a fire, and it was burning right there. Now, there's no way you can pull up your pants leg to there. The only solution for that is to lower the belt and try and get at it from the top. It was horrendous pain. And eventually I ran to the bathroom because the kids were playing there. I couldn't very well whip my pants down. <laughs> and I went to the bathroom and, and here was a sore on the top of my leg. It was blood red and full of bumps and the water was oozing out of it and it was burning like fire. It shut my mouth up for a while because I was just concentrating on the pain. And when she finally got out of that church, I was out of there. We rushed home and I said to her, look at this thing. And she looked at it and she says, I don't, I don't know what that is. I've never seen anything like it. It's not a bee sting or a spider bite. You think of all these possibilities. It doesn't look like anything. Like there's no puncture mark. It's just red and bumpy and leaking. And so... I said, okay, maybe, maybe there's something after all. And so I said, okay, 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 I'll, I'll give it another shot. If, if this is from you, then please take it away. And it was gone. Just like that. Gone. I said, wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> and then I said to my wife, you know what? I think we're going nuts. 
I think this is psychosomatic. I think we have religious overload. And somehow my nervous system induced this sort of stuff. I think this is all a load of rubbish. And I think we have to just cut loose from all this religious paraphernalia and just go back to our own lives because this thing, I think, comes from my mind. No way is this from God. And I hardly said that sentence. It was back. Ah. <laughs> oh. And it was so painful, it burned like fire. And it stayed there for, I don't know, two weeks. It wouldn't go away until I said, okay, okay. Nothing worked on it, nothing. Now, that's a supernatural experience. It's not one that defines my religion, but it's something that jerked me into reality. The bottom line is, we lost everything when I became a Seventh-day Adventist. I had to resign my job. I resigned it of my own accord because I couldn't go and reconcile teaching evolution and teaching um, creation at the same time. That's when I visited the rector. We put our house on the market. We sold our house. Off we went. And we had a partnership in a farm, and we were going to survive like that. But you name it, it went wrong. Every single thing went wrong. And when I resigned, I still had to work for, a, for one term, because you have to, you know, you have to give notice. You can't just walk away. And so, on this way to the farm, I have an accident. A headmaster rushes through the stop street and gets rid of my car. My other car, we had an old little beetle as well that my wife used to, well, she used to use it, but she, she always had to get people to push start it, right? Nothing worked. And then that one was written off. That was quite miraculous. Our little child was sitting in the back seat and then he fell asleep and he fell over. Mm. And I was turning, and as I was turning, this car, instead of going past me like it should, followed me around the corner and wiped me out and went right through that back window where my child's head was just a few seconds before. And he was trapped in a little box of metal underneath without any harm. Amazing stuff. Both cars gone. And I still have to drive to the university, so we rented a car. An old second-hand dealer somewhere who rents cars. And we rented this car. And then we lost our crops on the farm. Then the partners ran away. Oh, it was a nightmare. I went into debt like you cannot believe it. And my wife says, is this what we've come to? And then something went wrong with the car and we took the car back. And the man came out and he said, it's the battery, he's going to replace the battery. And uh, they were replacing the battery, etc., etc. My wife was standing one side and she was depressed. Everything's gone, our life is gone, our life is in turmoil, the job's gone, our money's gone, uh, people have left us when they should have stayed with us. Is this from God? Is this the truth? This cannot be the truth. And this man comes up to her and he says to her, your husband has a powerful weapon in his car. And my wife says, no, he doesn't carry a weapon. He says, yes, he does. Come, I'll show you. So he took her to the car and, and there was my Bible lying on the, the dash or whatever. And he said, there, oh, she says, the Bible. And so they talk, started talking, and then he said to her, where do you worship? And she said, she doesn't want to say Seventh-day Adventist. That's, that's, you know, taboo. She says, well, in that town. <laughs> and he says, no, 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 where do you worship? And she says, well, what can I say? So she says, Halderberg College. That's like saying Loma Linda University, you know. Alderberg College. He says, no, 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 I don't want to know that. What denomination? Where do you worship? 
And she also heard the cock crow, and so she said to him, <laughs> the Seventh-day Adventists. And he took a step back and he pointed at her and he said, they have the truth after all. That's fascinating. Why would he say that? In Afrikaans he said, Hulle het toch die waarheid. Which means they have the truth after all. And by that time everything was finished and we got into our car and we drove off and she told me, I just had an amazing experience. I said, what happened? She said, you know, the, the man who helped the man put in the battery, the one who had the overall on, while you were inside doing the paperwork, he had a chat to me, the one who put the battery into the car, the one with the overall. I said, what do you mean the one with the overall? She said, the one who helped the one who's working there. And I said, which one that helped the one? There was only one. She says, no, there were two. I said, no, there was one. She says, there were two. I said, no, there weren't two. There, were, there was one. What did he do? What did he say? So she said, he said, he said, he, they have the truth after all. I said, well, then he must be an Adventist if he says that the Adventists have the truth. Isn't that so? So we'll go back and we'll ask him because she was arguing. She always argues with me. <laughs> so we turned the car around and we drove back. And uh, he wasn't there, so I, we went inside to the man who helped me. And I said, excuse me, where's your worker, the one who, with the blue overall? He says, what? There's nobody else here but me. And so I think God takes situations into his hands and he gives you what you need when you need it. You will always have a hook to hang your doubt on, but you can choose to believe him too. Anyway, long story short, I got reappointed at another university. Within three years, I was professor of that university. And I could actually teach from my conviction. Not teach creation, but I didn't have to do anything in an evolutionary paradigm. And God blessed me. But I had huge opposition. Huge opposition. Three commissions of inquiry against me because they claimed you cannot be a true scientist and believe in God at the same time. In one case, when there was this inquiry, the man who was supposed to accuse me, on his way to the accusation, he fell over and collapsed. And all his accusations were proven wrong. And the next day he was back at work, and the commission was gone, having exonerated me, and they knew not what was wrong with him. They couldn't find anything wrong with him. You know what? Little things. God is amazing. And that man over there, that, that little man, I call him the pain in the neck. Woof. <laughs> he is tenacious. He doesn't give up. Amen. He drags you into this world and he put me on the stage at my old alma mater and they shouted and screamed at me. And then he left me. <laughs> he went a thousand miles away and left me all to myself. And I... I was asked to give more lectures, and I had nothing. He used to give the spiritual ones. I used to give the science one. Now he's gone. And so God forced me to develop my own series. There were no computers in those days, and I was totally bankrupt. I paid the debt of other Adventists for 15 years. 15 years. We had hardly anything to eat. I've been invited to go overseas and do this, and I've got, I haven't got any money. I've got nothing. We're struggling. And I have to make these slides. So I went and bought film that was past its expiry date. And I made my own rolls of film in the dark room, and I started taking pictures of whatever I was lecturing on. And then I would give the lecture that evening after university time, 
And I was thinking, how am I going to feed my family? I've just spent my money on all those films. And somebody would come to me and say, here's something for you. And it would be exactly the amount that I'd just paid on those films. God never let me pay for anything in his work. I would have to supply it and he'd give it back. Supply it and he'd give it back. And little things all along the line, giving you confidence. And then the very first meeting where I was invited overseas, I was invited to give a talk or lecture series, a whole, my first big series was in Vancouver. And there I went, and as usual, the letters preceded me, don't let this man talk, don't let him do this, and he will preach vegan lifestyle, that's from the devil, he'll preach this, he'll preach that, he'll preach that, don't let him speak. So I get overseas and I get this cold shoulder. Nobody. You're all alone. Except the people that I didn't know who had invited me to give the talk. Double sessions. 1,260 people. Massey Hall Theater, Vancouver. Double sessions. Now I'm giving the first session, I'm giving the lectures on the Antichrist. You know, like the pioneers gave it, you say the Antichrist is the Pope. You know, like they did it in the old days. And after the first lecture, this crowd is highly antagonistic. They come rushing forward and they want to sort me out right here on the stage, here in the front, and there was no way out. And I was all alone, I had no help. And I'm saying, God, what am I going to do? Help me here. I'm in big trouble. And there was a little boy with Down syndrome who every night, there was a side door like that, came in, and there was one chair open. It was that aisle over there where that lady is sitting. That chair was always open. Irrespective of how full it was, it was jam-packed. Every seat taken, that chair was open. And then he'd come in and he'd sit down there and he'd sing his little song. He couldn't speak. He was very, very downs. And then when they come and antagonized me, he would come with his little arms and dig his way through. And he'd come and put his arms around me and he'd put his head about here. It was about whose size? <laughs> he'd put his head here. And then he'd sing. Just a song, la, 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 la. Now, I told the story at La Sierra also, but I'll tell it again because it's such a cute story. And it's impossible to hit someone who has a Down syndrome kid hanging on him. <laughs> it's impossible. You, nobody, not even the most wicked person in the world could bring himself to do that. Isn't that so? And so I became very dependent on this chap. And I'd give the first lecture, and sometimes he wasn't there. I panicked. I said, where's my Down syndrome, boy? And I'd stretch the lecture. You don't think I can do that, eh? And then that door would open, and he'd come down, and he'd sit down. Ah, and then I'd finish my lecture. And he came and gave me my hug. Now, I didn't know where he came from. I thought he was part of the furniture. You know, he belongs to the overseers, the people who work in the hall, or maybe he lives next door, maybe they're used to him. I don't know. We finished the main thrust portion of the campaign and then invited the people to the church on the other side of Vancouver. That's a big city. And then I didn't see him again, and we went through all our lectures, and quite a few people were actually baptized in that campaign, which was very thrilling and exciting, my first public campaign. And uh, I missed my little Down syndrome boy. And on the last day, Adventists are very kind. They only give you six or seven lectures on a day. <laughs> I went through my last lecture, and the people were sitting in the church, and then I had to resort my slides. And in that last lecture... The back opens and the Down syndrome boy comes walking down and comes and sits in the front. Interestingly enough, on that same position where he always sat, chair was open. 
and you could have knocked me over with a feather. Where were his parents? Where was any adult support? None whatsoever. He cannot be part of the furniture. We're on the other side of Vancouver. How did he get there? He can't, cannot take a bus or a train. He wouldn't have the capacity to find the place by himself. And here he is, all by himself. And I looked at him and I couldn't believe it. And I finished my, my sermon or whatever it was. And then all the people went into the foyer for drinks. And I was packing my slides and he was sitting there. And I looked at him, and he looked at me, and I was packing. And then he got up, and he walked around, and he went up, just like here. And he came up on the stage. I was standing over here, just like here, packing my thing. And he came, and he put his arm around me. And he put his little head here. While I was, it was hard now. I had to pack with one hand. <laughs> and he did his little song, and I looked at him, and I looked at this. And I, I plucked up the courage. And I said to myself, this is, this is not normal. And I took him like this, and I pushed him away from me like this. And I took a step back from him, and I said to him, Do me a favor, tell me, are you a man or are you an angel? And what he did was he did this. And he walked off, and he was gone. And nobody has ever seen him. But there are hundreds of witnesses who witness this every night, that this thing happened. And you know what? That was my first campaign. And that little Down syndrome boy is standing right here. But I don't need to see him anymore. And you will have to accept by faith that he's standing here. And when they rush at you on the stage like they did in Slovenia, to literally get rid of us forever. I know he was there. And so he will be in every campaign as we go along. And if you have any need or any requirement, God has sent that chariot. And that chariot has everything that you need. I can tell you a thousand stories of how God worked in our lives, how people... In my very first European campaign, they phone me and they say, will you please organize an airplane ticket and will you please come? And I'm too shy to tell them, listen, I, I haven't got the money to pay for this. We'll pay you back when you get here. Yeah, but how do I uh, pay before I get there? <laughs> I sold my car. I sold my car. My wife wife had to walk. I sold my car. And I bought the tickets. And all my money was gone. I had no money to leave for her. My salary every month went into debt. I said to God, now I'm, who's going to take care of my family when I'm gone? She hasn't got any money. Who's going to buy food for her? What's going to happen? And the phone rings and somebody says, where do you live? And it's a woman from far away. And she said she had a dream doesn't know me from a bar of soap. Where do you stay? I had a dream. I must give you something. I said, no, I don't need anything. Who, who are you? What? No, I had a dream. And she sends her son over, gives us an envelope. And it's enough money to take care of my wife for that week. These are the little things. We've sat around a table with no food on it saying, with our kids with goggle eyes like this, saying, Lord, thank you for what we are about to receive. And then the phone rings, and the person says, have you been to your front door? And we go to the front door, and there's a basket with food. We went in and put it on the table. Can you imagine what that does to a kid? And what it does to you? Don't underestimate our God. These things are far apart, but little incidences. I'm on my way to there, and God says, no, even if I take your car away, you're not going there, you're going over there. And then you end up over there, and in the end you end up over here, as a consequence of having been over there where you thought you weren't going. Isn't that so? And you can say it's chance. 
Or you could, by the eyes of faith, see the hand of God working behind the scenes. And that's your choice. That's your choice. And I want to encourage you. We are on the threshold of going home. The chariot in heaven is being prepared. The angels are using the shining polish. And that wagon is on its way. Don't lose your faith now. Don't let go of the third angel's message, the three angels' messages, as Joshua read to us. That message will not decline, it will increase. And don't let yourself be duped into giving up because someone gives you a blow on the shoulder or a harsh word. We're here because it is the Lord's business. Amen.